From the EPAWA headquarters in South Allentown, Pennsylvania, it's time for Weather Weeklies, an informative video of the ins and outs of weather that affect you most in the EPAWA coverage area. The following segment is a weekly video blog, and the opinions of the forecaster do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the staff of Eastern PA Weather Authority LLC as a whole, nor its constituents. Without further ado, here is meteorologist Bobby Marchers with Weather Weeklies. A good Sunday morning to you. Another edition of Weather Weeklies for Sunday, September 13th, after a week off for the Labor Day holiday. Uh, I have a lot to discuss in this video here today. We're going to look at uh, the long range and then go into some uh, some signals for winter uh, and our closest analog matches for that. Uh, here is what we're starting off with the long range September, October. We just updated this a few days ago. Here is uh, the next two days below average here. We have uh, obviously high confidence in that. And then uh, the period from the 15th to the 25th, we have above average. Now, when we talk about above average, we're not talking about 90s anymore. I think we're talking about uh, temperatures generally 5 to 8 degrees above normal. And you got to remember, normal this time of year now is starting to go down, so we're getting into the fall months or approaching fall. So we're now talking about temperatures that are in this period anyway, uh, in the lower set, lower to upper between the lower 70s up north and the upper 70s down south. So if we're above average here, uh, you could just be 85 and you're still above average. You can be the lower 80s and you're above average. All right. So this is not mean 90s. I don't want anybody excited here about. Oh man, here comes the heat and humidity again. Okay, we will be above average for this time of year. This is all relative to average. And then we go to the end of the month, the 26th to the 30th, we drop down back to near average. You'll notice again, uh, the month of October, we now have the entire month below average indicated here in the long range. Now, this is not new. We've uh, been talking about this in the uh, in the autumn outlook. We have our, the month of October below average. And uh, it doesn't make sense to some people. I don't know if you know, we're way above normal this month. And then we go back to below average in the month of October, above average again in November. How does that make any sense? Well, there is precedent for that, okay? And I'll show you that. Uh, precipitation, we caught up a little bit here with this uh, rain we had on Thursday and then again on Saturday. So uh, I do think we hit a dry period this week here, but we should average this entire period, the 11th to the 30th, at near average uh, for the rest of the month in, in terms of precipitation. Of course, this week's going to be a little bit dry, and we're going to be a little warm this week, too. Here's your anomalies for this week. Uh, this is at its highest point. This is going to be uh, Thursday, Friday time frame. Our coverage area here is going to be the generally 5 to 8 Fahrenheit above normal uh, for the upcoming week. And then I think it stays warm into the into the weekend next weekend. might not be quite as warm uh, as it was during the week, but it's still going to be above normal nonetheless. Again, temperatures are generally running you know, 70, 72 up here and down here, probably about 77, 78, 79. So... Um, you know, it, it's all relative to, to normal here, and this is the anomaly showing what we're looking at for this upcoming week. Now, let's get into uh, September here. Uh, this is our closest matching analogs for the month of September. We used 57 and 87 in our autumn outlook, and we did this purposely because we factor all these. Uh, when you look at the uh, at the different years in the past, and when you're looking at analogs, what you're doing, you're looking at this current year and the setup, and then not just what El Nino is doing. We're looking at quasi-biennial oscillation. Uh, we're looking at uh, things like sunspots, sun solar activity. We're looking at the stratosphere. We're looking at uh, the PDO. PDO is a big factor. We're looking at a lot of different things to come up with this and say, okay, well, we have this, 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 and this. Okay. What are we? Uh, what years match up with us the most, the most closely? We came up with 50, 57 and 87 as our two closest matches. We had about uh, six or seven different analogs that were relatively close that we uh, we figured into our outlook. But here's what uh, the years, if you blend 57 and 87 together, this is what you had as far as temperatures. Now these reds and yellows, these are all above normal. Here's the scale down here. Anything in white would be near normal. And anything in the blues here are below normal. And then it goes down, the, the darker the color here, darker the blue, uh, the more below normal it is. All right. Now, we all know that this month has been well above normal across this entire eastern seaboard. So if we separate these two, uh, 1957 and 1987, and just take a look at 1957, and look what it did. Okay. Well above normal temperatures here in the eastern seaboard, cooler than average in the center of the country, warm in the Pacific Northwest. This is what's going on right now or what is projected to go on in the month of September. So this is very close. I think September 57 is still our number one match. Now, does that translate into the into the winter months? We think so. 
Uh, we're going to follow the trends over the next couple of months and see what happens. Here's what uh, the months of October, month of October did, uh, averaging those two composite years of 57 and 87, below normal across the eastern part of the United States. So everything that was in the center of the country here, that cold air, now shifts to the east here, okay, and we get cold air or colder air than normal in both October uh, 57 and, and 1987. Taking a look at uh, 57 by itself though, wasn't quite as cold as 1987 was, okay? So, but you're still below normal. This is somewhere between uh, maybe one and three degrees below normal here across the across our coverage area here in 1957, October 1957. So there's no reason to think that won't happen again. All right, everything we're looking at now again. This isn't just this isn't just, isn't just looking at apples to oranges and the same. Well, this looks like 57, so this is what it's going to do. Everything else that we're looking at, there's a lot of things that go into this, and I could bore you to death, okay, with all the different things we look at that would favor this. I mean, you could be talking about SOI values. You could be talking about a lot of different things, but they all go into this and factor in, and everything collaborates that this is going to be a colder than average October. This doesn't mean we're going to have a repeat of the Halloween snowstorm of 2011. It means below average based on, uh, for the entire month, that's the at, the at the end of the month, when all is said and done, the month average is 1 to 3 degrees below normal across our coverage area. It means you're going to have some cool periods. You might have some warm periods. might not always be below normal in the month of October. But the month as a whole will average below normal, we think. And uh, we're not talking about snow just yet, so don't get excited. Uh, we are talking about the CFS V2, though. Uh, this is uh, this is a, has been a big change here. This is a a Nino 3.4 forecast. Uh, when looking at uh, the Nino uh, areas that that are of concern, we we're most concerned about Nino 3.4, which is right here. Now, if you look at this, is hard to see here, uh, but here's Hawaii right here. Here's the here's Central America, okay, and here's the South uh, here's South America. All right, Nino one and two is right off the South American coast. We don't want the warm, the greatest warming to be here because that means we're going to have a warm winter, unless you want a warm winter, of course. Uh, if you want cold and snow, though, uh, you're going to need this back here in 3.4. All right, you're going to need the best warming to be out here, at least elongated. I mean, it's fine that it's warm over here, but if it, it needs to be the focus of the convection is going to follow the greater area of greatest warmth, and that convection needs to be back here in 3.4. Because what the uh, convection does, that's the, that's your Madden Julian oscillation. Your convection along the uh, equator in relation to the international date line, which is right here, as long as the convection is east of that uh, date line, uh, it's going to throw heights to the western ridge, and it gives you a trough in the east, and you get some colder weather here. This is what happened a lot last year and the year before. Okay, so when we look at the CFS V2 and the Nino forecast, we everybody's heard about the Godzilla El Nino and uh, media ran where that one had a had a field day with it. That's anything uh, a Super El Nino. A Super El Nino is anything uh, above this line here. So if you look at the winters of 1982, 1983, and also 97, 98, very little in the way of snowfall. Of course, 82, 83 was saved by a late season snowstorm. Basically, one storm, a big blizzard at the end blizzard of 83 that saved winter. Otherwise, it would have been just like 97, 98. And they were both up here in the Super Nino category here. Now, you look at this chart here. This is a measure of, uh, this is the ENSO values, okay? This is ONI, the ONI index. And this is this would be a neutral, okay? Anything negative would be La, uh, La Nina. Anything positive is El Nino. Once you get above 2.5 on this scale, it's considered a Super Nino. The reason they're calling it a Godzilla El Nino is because it would be challenging the, the highest, uh, warmest sea surface temp temperatures on record. Okay. Now, latest runs of this model, CFS, are indicated here in blue. These are little spaghetti plots. All right. They're ensemble members. So, in other words, they have uh, eight members that run, and they, uh, they can come up with an average or a mean. Now, uh, the previous runs were up here in red. These are all up here in this Super Nino territory. The majority of them are up here, and then they tail off. Okay? The latest runs here in blue are now saying, uh-uh. Now they're going to be, it'll be strong, strong El Nino, flirting with Super El Nino, but not quite, and then dropping off. Okay? And the peak here would be late October through mid-November. This is your peak, and then it starts to climb. Okay? So your highest, at your highest point is, is late October, through mid-November when El Nino peaks and then the water start to cool off a little bit in the Pacific, uh, the Equatorial Pacific. Okay, 
So now I have never been. This is this is an editorial blog. So this is this is my opinion. This is not the opinion of my other fellow forecasters. This is the opinions of Bobby Martrich. I have never been a fan of the Super Nino or the Godzilla El Nino. I think uh, that we get strong. I'm not. We come close to, come close to, uh, very strong territory, and then we drop off significantly. By the time we get down to January. February, look where it is, down here to 1.5 to 2. That's close to moderate. So I don't think that you hear a lot of forecasts out there saying we're going to have a strong El Nino going all the way through winter. I don't think so. I think we start off strong, and then we tail off. Pretty pretty drastic drop here. By the time we get to you know mid to late February into March and everything, we're down to moderate again. Okay, so which changes the game quite a bit when you're talking about snow and trying to forecast seasonally. All right, so I just want to touch on that here, and I do uh, like the idea of this coming close to a strong El Nino, but not quite making it, or maybe just barely touching it, and then dropping off sniff, sniff, uh, significantly. With that being the case, here's our analog uh, years we used in the, in the Autumn Outlook. The very strong years, 82, 83, you can scratch that. 70, 97, 98, very strong, scratch that. 2006, 2007, brief, moderate, well, that's not what we're doing either, so you can scratch that. Okay, that leaves it with three strong years. Now, I'm not going to completely scratch these off and not include them. When I say scratch them, but this is for argument's sake, just based on, on the uh, on the ENSO. Okay, our three that are left here, you'll notice the PDO here. PDO is warm right now, like 57, 58. The other two are cool. It is not a cool PDO year. So that leaves 57, 58 as our number one analog. Okay, now coming in into... Uh, when we get into the winter months, we're going to be f focusing on things like the NAO. Uh, that's your blocking, and that became very important that year with uh, with going negative in January and February. And we had a ton, a ton of snow in the second half of winter. So I uh, just want to take one example. Uh, that year, I will use two. I know Philadelphia had almost 42 inches of snow here in 1957, 1958. Allentown, PA had 63 inches of snow. But by January 31st, they were both under a foot of snow. So in other words, the first half was very warm. You had a grand total of less than a foot of snow in both locations. But both finished well, well above normal. So 50 inches of snow, 51 inches in fact, fell in Allentown, Pennsylvania, just in the months of February and March alone. So that's what we're looking at for this upcoming winter right now. If I had to put a guess on that, that's what I'd say. But, of course, there's a lot of things that go into that. Not saying we're getting that much snow either, so just don't don't jump the gun here. Here's what we're talking about with the El Nino. Here's your El Nino right here, okay? And uh, the focus of this this needs to be, the, the greatest warming needs to be somewhere in this area right here, okay? Not over here. If it's over here, you throw heights at the eastern coast, and then you get warm weather here. You don't want that if you want snow, okay? Also, you have a warm PDO, okay? See all this warm water? I hear these reds are all indicating above normal. Anything in the blues and greens is or below normal. So you have below normal up here, like the warm PDO shows. You have a cold pool out here, warm here, okay? This is your warm PDO. So that's why we eliminated those other strong El Nino years. And taking a look at uh, some of these other years that people are talking about, here's September 2009. I wanted to show you this here. Uh, I keep hearing that 2009-2010 winter is a very close analog. I don't think so, and the reason is, look at all this cold air up here. This is all cold water. We don't have that here. Now, we have the blocking here. That's great. And we have the El Nino. But this is not what it looks like here now. This is September 2009 now. This isn't the winter. All this cold air up here in the Gulf of Alaska, or cold water, and we don't have that right now. Going back to our chart here of current, look how warm it is here. So I don't know how you can make that comparison. It's a completely different setup. So 2009, 2010, I'm not even considering. September 1997, okay, very, this is the Super El Nino year. Very, very, very warm here in Nino 1 and 2 regions. This is, again, this is not where you want it. You want it further west. And I think it's going to be further west this year, like 57, 58 right about here, not focused right here near off the coast of South America. Okay, well, so uh, in September, uh, you had some warmer waters up here in 1997. Well, obviously, we're colder up there now. It's completely different. Still did have the warm PDO. That's fine. 
but uh, a, lot, a lot different of a setup here in 1997-1998. So I don't like 97-98 as an analog at all. Okay. Uh, one thing with blocking here, uh, this is in the winter months, of course. This is a look at the 2009-2010 blocking pattern. I do think the blocking pattern might be similar this year, and uh, that is your, your heights are raised here over Greenland, and uh, then, you know, you have anything coming up here in this uh, tracking along the southern jet here will have the opportunity to turn up the coast here and give you some bigger storms. That's the idea of blocking. We'll get into that on a more case-by-case -case basis when we get in deep into winter here. But I did want to break down what uh, what the winter of 1957-1958 did because that is our closest analog. Again, uh, we're going uh, in 1957-1958 featured a very warm September. We have that this year. A colder than average October, but not by a whole lot, one to three degrees below normal. Okay, that's what we're going with this year. A warm November and warm December. Here's December, okay? Warm December. Here's all warm. Here's your cold down here, and you got cold here in the northwestern United States, or actually northwestern, northwestern part here of this map, which is southwestern Canada, okay? Everywhere else, you're above normal and warm for the month of December, so I don't think you're starting off very cold and snowy in December. It's going to be a second half winter, most likely. We do transition in January. Here, your warmest stays up here. You got blocking showing up here, and you got a colder than average temperatures across the southeast. Some of that starting to creep up in our area, not quite. So I think January is your January is your transition month, where you might start off warm, might still have some a lot of warm periods in in, in uh, January, but toward the end of the month we start going back down, and then February. The bottom drops out for February and March here, where we get some really cold here, and you have blocking up here across Greenland. So you got some really a really good setup going into February, March. So when we do our winter outlook, we're going to look how things transpire in the next couple months. And there's definitely a lot of things to go into this besides just this. I just want to look at the uh, El Nino breakdown and what uh, what we're looking at right now, just from an El Nino standpoint, just from a Climo standpoint. And then we're going to factor all the things in there like snow cover, uh, what the PDO is doing, the, the, how the, the ENSO is, pro, uh, uh, the, the El Nino is progressing, uh, where it's progressing, uh, looking at some other analogs and things like that to all factor into our winter forecast that's due out on November 13th. A lot of things to look at between now and then, but right now we have a good base with 57.58. And uh, we'll go from there. And, of course, we're going to be discussing this every single week. We update this uh, weekly in our, in our uh, seasonal discussion, a long-range discussion in our weather forum. So if you want to become a part of that for the winter, uh, please click on the, uh, the link below this video, and it'll take you right to it, give you information how to sign up for that, become a part of that discussion. We will update that more frequently coming up through the fall, uh, definitely with the uh, updates on the latest information on El Nino and what to expect for the upcoming winter. I'm Eastern PA Weather Authority meteorologist Bobby Marchers, and that is this edition of Weather Weeklies for Sunday, September 13, 2015. Have a great week.